morning. Good morning. Welcome to this place where we worship Jesus and we serve God in my way by serving our neighbor. And I'm going to invite you as a first opening part of worship to join me in singing hymn number 46. Hymn number 46. This is my father's world. You're able, please stand here.
game readiness, so to speak. So thank you all for your attention and thank you all for your understanding in that. <clears throat> you have an insert that's called the Heavenly Tea that uh, Ashley Scarborough and I were kicking this around some time ago and she's taken the lead on it. But this is going to be a, a tea April 23rd on Saturday morning for mothers, daughters, small ages. And so we want to encourage you to sign up to come. We've had some of you uh, send that out. But it's not just necessarily the biological mother or grandmother in that. It could be someone who is that figure for you, that trusted person with you, who has guided you, been that person for you. So we want to encourage you that this is open for you at that, at that moment. Uh, we are getting in some of the graduate information. We want to continue to encourage that and uh, continue just to get volunteers who want to be part of the church's ministries as they unfold and as we define them and redefine them. So you'll be hearing more about that in the next week or so. In preparation and continuation of our worship, I want you to, to really meditate on, on God's Word this morning as I'll be preaching from the second chapter, uh, well, third chapter of John. And in that uh, conversation that's going on between a Pharisee who's older in years named Nicodemus, who's kind of the height of his professional career, maybe even at the end of it by some indications, it follows on the heels of Jesus cleansing the temple that we talked about last week. So there's been this clash that Jesus has had with the established religious community. And Nicodemus, as we will discover, comes to talk to Jesus. But in the midst of that, Jesus says these, these wonderful words, John 3, 17. That he has not come into this world to condemn the world. This morning, I want you to meditate as we are continuing in our presentation and our preparation for worship. What areas in your life have you brought into this mood, this room, this? What experiences have you brought in this morning where you either were the person feeling like I want to condemn other people or? have had the experience of having been condemned. The object of people's consternation or talk or chatter or gossip or condemnation full bore. Because we're going to be sitting in the presence of Jehovah, the presence of Almighty God as they could deal with And we're going to be sitting in His presence and He is the invitation, His invitation for you and for me this morning sit in his presence, knowing that in Christ, therefore, there is no condemnation. But you're invited. Let's go to the Lord in prayer silently as we approach him this morning.
this tree that you see here. This is the season that we are in right now, and it's spring. And the first day of spring comes in the month of March. Now, if you look at this tree, you'll see it has uh, green leaves. It had, even has a little red bird up there, doesn't it? And the red bird's in the tree. It's got tulips down at the bottom. And then it's got some blossoms where it's just started blooming. And that's what you see now in the springtime, isn't it? You see things where, uh, <laughs> you see things where they are just beginning to bloom. So this is the spring. Come 
at night when I get home from working in the vineyard, so to speak. Cleaning out, culling. And every time I pull out more pictures, it has brought to mind more memories, more recalling to the present certain people, certain instances. Uh, and what I've been doing is creating three boxes, one for each daughter, putting that stuff in. But I came across a, a picture of Stan Ward. Stan Ward was a gentleman that I met and worked with during the late 80s, during the height of the farm crisis, another one of those pasture disaster seasons. And Stan is from Kansas. And I lost touch with Stan somewhere around 1990, 91, when I moved to, to uh, Newberry at the time. And it was interesting that looking at Stan's space, I was immediately transported to the night that we were in Washington, D.C., and we were part of the 1986 uh, Farm Bill Conversations trying to get mental health funds to rural communities. And yes, I was just a preacher, but I was in the mix of all these farmers trying to do something magnanimous and grand for farmers who were losing their land and who were part of the whole herd buyouts and part of all that was going on that you might remember during the late 80s. Stan worked with the University of Kansas, but he was also a mental health worker. He'd grown up on a farm and he had lost a family farm. And he was part of all of that conversation. And the reason the picture was staring out at me and, and brought me to this moment is that he said, he never called me Harry, like some of you call me Dr. Workman. Much of my protest is called me Harry. Come on. That's what my mama called me, Harry. She said, don't ever get too big for your bridges. Don't forget your raisin. I mean, you heard. But he would, he would, he never used my name. He would call me preacher. Pharmacist, good to see you here. <laughs> Store manager, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Don't always just call somebody by what they do. That's not who all they are. But he would only call me preacher. Preacher. And on one of our occasions, as we were wrestling with some of the nuances of the mental health bill that we were trying to, to get as part of the farm bill, Stan said, let's, let's go for a walk. And we did. And being from the country and naive, we went for a walk at night in D.C. And we ended up on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, really, literally just a few steps away from where Dr. Martin Luther King had delivered his I Have a Dream speech. It's marked on the steps where he stood. And we were sitting above that, looking out over the wall. Beautiful and lovely at night. And Stan said, Preacher, why shouldn't I kill myself? I wasn't expecting that. Dr. Little, you've been on those steps many times as you were at Bethesda, as you were at Walter Reed in the Pentagon. As I looked at the picture of Stan, all of this came rushing back because he, he wanted to get away from the group. He wanted to talk at night and he wanted to talk about things that meant something to him. And he was asking a deep question. Why shouldn't I kill myself? Stan's the kind of guy that when he met you, he would look you in the eye and he would shake you firmly with a handshake. It was not a perfunctory ritual of greeting of, hey, how are you? You knew he was fully present when he shook your hand. He had been raised on the farm. He had been taught the value of a handshake and the value of the word. But you see, all of those familiar virtues and vitalities and all of those things that had been part and parcel of his raising about what was truth and what was solid and what was to be counted on in terms of virtues had disappeared. His third marriage was crumbling under the weight of having lost the farm, having lost a connection with his history, a 
sense of depression of not only letting his present bride down and the family and the two brides before her, but also the long line of family history who had kept the farm together through thick and thin. He was losing it on his watch. Why shouldn't I kill myself preaching? You see, Stan represented then and he represents now the moment in our time when we're, we, we, we've become so disconnected to our histories, we've become disconnected to the traditions of who we are, that we have fragmented ideologies that compete with each other. And many of the conversations that I have and have had with students and with older people who are coming or nearing the end of their life's journey or who are in that place of, of middle, of, of what I call the middling, not midlife, but the middling, because it can come not just at a certain age, but I start to question, is this all there is? Is my life simply the sum total of every job that I've had, my bank account, my kids, is, is, just, is this the definition of who I am and where I am in my life? And we try desperately to either take, as Jay Lifton, who's a social historian, says, we either try to take the inner way, and that is I'm just going to focus on me, and I'm going to get better, and I'm going to go to the self-help section, <laughs> and I'm just going to concentrate on just me and I'm going to I'm going to develop the me or we sit in the corner waiting for revelation something to come out from outside of us that will somehow magically fix our circumstances and look for that savior and we'll look for it in all kinds of ways Jay Lipton says this is one of the roots of our polarized political system because so many people are still waiting for something to fix our situation from the outside on an earthly historical level. Just this week too, in addition to looking at pictures and thinking about some of that momentous occasion with Stan, I also ran into some folks in our own community in Twin Harbor in their neighborhood an elderly man who's so sad at heart because his children won't talk to him. And his children have not spoken to him in years and he knows that the end is coming. And he's wrestling with questions. Isn't it interesting that questions and, and, and pain intensifies at night? Why is that? Why is it that we can deal with the disability or, or, or pain during the day, but when night comes, our depression, our aches and pains, our loneliness, our grief seems to intensify? Last week I was in Raleigh doing a baby dedication for a young woman who had been a youth member of our church in Greenville and she's in uh, the CBs now and she she has had a lovely, lovely, lovely hard time. And now she's a single parent. But she wanted to do something, something for her, her child, her boy as a single mom and she reached back to a time when she was getting help and growing and she reached out and she said, Pastor Harry, is it real? Is this God real that you've talked about, that we've talked about? Is he, if I, if I dedicate my baby, if I, if I give him to God, is it real? Friday, I was just going to Rockingham to get a wood stove. 
I was a little old me as, as Drew. Because the gentleman had told me, you're going to have to have something to take the pipes apart. <laughs> so I needed to get a drill with a nut driver that could take the pipes apart. And when I got there, I discovered Sam, who is 54 years old, is living with COVID cancer. And what was just a, what I thought of an appointment to get a wood stove that I have yet to determine where it's going to be located, but I know it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> it turned into, as the shadows lengthened, a conversation and questions about life and death and the whys. You see, I think Nicodemus is not unlike us. He's not some physical figure. I think the conversation, the invitation, the individual conversation with, with Jesus is an invitation that Jesus makes to you and to me. Nicodemus did not realize he was sitting in the presence of the king. I, 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 I shared a, a meme this week uh, writing about God's name, Yahweh. You see, when you say it, Yahweh. It's like a breathing. In comes the Spirit. Jesus is going to talk to Nicodemus about the Spirit. Is When someone is born, the Spirit. When God brings into us His Spirit. When God gives us new life through His Spirit. You see, everything had been external to Nicodemus at this time. Everything has been so external to so many of us who have just been looking for the inner way. I just want to be a better person or the outer revelation that we want to come save us. We've just kept it at bay, but God is inviting us to this moment of personal relationship where Yahweh, Yahweh is breathed into us through the power of His Holy Spirit. And Nicodemus doesn't get it. He doesn't get it because we don't get it. We didn't get it at first. He didn't get it then. Questions in the dark that Nicodemus brought are the same questions that Stan, that Sam, that all of us bring. That intensify the dark, that intensify when we allow our minds finally to focus, to focus. And Jesus invites Nicodemus. I don't know, Lord. I don't know, Rabbi. He didn't call him Lord. I, I, I don't know, Rabbi. You must be with God. You can do these things. And Jesus begins to open the door to the breath of life where the inner and the outer are joined together in one moment, where Jesus brings together revelation and inner peace, where he brings together a historical moment and tradition into one moment. He starts to bring the temple into the presence. He had announced in the temple the week before or some time before when he cleaned it out, he said, my body, my body is the new temple. And so now we see this Pharisee, this man of the law, this man who's used to the temple, sitting at the temple. He's sitting at the physical temple of God. He's sitting in the presence of God Almighty. And God begins to speak to him, unless you are born again through water and the Spirit, which evokes pictures of creation. It, it evokes pictures of physical birth and the breaking of water and the emergence of new life and that first gasping moment of Yahweh of new life of spirit and blood and life and bone and question and pain all in one moment. And I can see Nicodemus taking his yarmulke off and going, I don't know. I don't know. How does that even happen? He 
you've ever been in the presence of someone who has died, who is a believer, and who has peace, you understand what transition is what really like. Of being prepared for new birth. But Jesus isn't just talking about eternity at this point. He's talking about the invitation in a personal level right now that, that you and I can really get our arms around. You, as you're born again, as you let the Spirit of God recreate you, as you let the Spirit of God make you the new person that He is creating and wants you to be, as you allow Him to do that, don't resist it. And don't keep it at arm's length or think that it's just bound by a tradition. If you will allow God to be God and do that, Jesus is saying, allowing you to be born again, you get the gift of living a new life. A new life. A new person. Being a new being. You may say, Harry, I, I've done that. I, I, I've done that. I've given my life to Jesus, but there's still pain. Yes, there is. Because when we give our lives to Christ, when we are born again, it doesn't remove us from this world. We are now being prepared for the next. This is not home, friends. This is the end of the journey. This is not heaven. This is not the place where we're destined to be the rest of our eternity. This is not it. This is the beginning. And that's why I say when you are with someone who is at the end of his or her life and being transitioned and you, that person is a person of faith, you are never so close to eternity on this side of the veil. You are looking at eternity taking place and a transition to new birth taking place. Nicodemus still had questions in the dark. Stan would live. He didn't commit suicide. He still created havoc in his marriage. He ended up by the 1990s, he was still teaching at the University of Kansas. But he had started down a path of exploring the roots of his faith again. I don't know where he ended up. I lost touch. It's like I lose touch with a lot of people that I've ministered to over the years. But I'm praying that I'm going to be mindful and knowledgeable of those outcomes when we get together in eternity. And that there will be a great reading. I want you to, to just close with me in thinking about this personal relationship that Jesus is offering to you and me because up at this moment, up until this moment in history, again, the temple was the only place to worship. Only the high priest could go to the Holy of Holies. And without Nicodemus even knowing it, he's sitting in the presence of Jehovah. He's sitting in the presence of the only one who can make his new life new. And we'll see him again, again, uh, about three years later. And he's going to be one with Joseph out of Arimathea, who actually takes down Jesus' body and helps prepare it for burial. So there was not an immediate conversion that morning, and there may not be an immediate conversion for you or immediate aha. But if you will begin this morning just drinking in, letting God's Holy Spirit begin to give you freshness of life and spirit direction and the truth that he wants you to be born 
anew born again. That's the offer for you this morning. It's the gift to you and me this morning. Lee, would you do surely the presence or will you have something else there? Yep, I trust you. I trust you. As Lee plays, let's just, again, let our minds be meditating on what has God said to you this morning? And then secondly, what are you going to do with it? Let's let God's Spirit minister to us here as we close. Thank you. 